Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on OCT interpretation in retinal disease. This is a practical approach where we show a lot of uh, slides, pictures, and also example OCT, uh, which at the end of this webinar, which is about one and a half hours, you will be able to understand the principle of OCT in imaging retinal diseases. And also you should be able to do basic and rudimentary interpretation of common retinal diseases. This is brought to you by Isaac in Mid Valley. And today uh, I'm Dr. Wong. I'll be one of the speaker and my co-speaker will be Dr. Ho Wai On, who is a retina and cornea surgeon. He'll be uh, taking you through initially on the uh, principles of OCT. In other words, how OCT works in the eye. And then after that, I will give a, probably a half an hour to 40 minutes lecture on common retinal diseases that you may encounter in your practice and followed by case examples by Dr. Ho Wai On. And at the end of this, we can have a brief discussion uh, to answer whatever questions that you have. If you want to share some images all right, uh, to us, you can also uh, perhaps share on this platform and then just let us know and then we uh, allow you to share screen and then we can discuss during the Q&A. And without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Ho Wai On, who is a British trained ophthalmologist and uh, he has double fellowship both in retinal disease and corneal disease and is based full time in Isaac Mid Valley. He's going to start his uh, presentation. Wai On. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for taking time in your busy practice uh, to join us in this uh, hopefully educational afternoon. Whereby, first of all, first and foremost, I want to talk about principles of optical coherence tomography. Everyone knows what an OCT is. Basically, it's a machine that captures a scan of the back of the eye, particularly the macula. Now. Not many of us unfortunately knows the principle of OCT. So I'll take the opportunity to share with you my understanding of the principles of uh, OCT. Can you? OCT, the, 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 advantage, the greatest advantage of OCT is that it's a non-contact and non-invasive technique for imaging biological tissue. When I use the word biological means the retina. Other than that, you can also image the skin in dermatology as well as blood vessels in the vascular uh, uh, fraternity. OCT is analogous to ultrasound, except that it measures light. And once we dilate the fundus, the retina is fully accessible to the ophthalmologist. And of course, we can use a specialized machine like OCT to capture the uh, retina. Now, uh, OCT scan is based on low coherence interferometry or near-infrared near light. It is a very powerful imaging technique which can capture high resolution of the retina, specifically the macula, at high speed at real time. When a high speed, basically up to 100 scans within a second. Now, the first OCT was conceptualized in 1990 where a cross-sectional topographic image of the RP of the human eye was uh, made. It's not until 1996, a first commercialized OCT instrument was available. On the right here, you could see that this is the basic uh, illustration or a, a cartoon picture of what of the basic principles of OCT. We have got low coherent source of light being passed out here, and then it is split by this splitter beam into a reference beam and a probing beam. This probing beam basically is uh, directed towards the retina. And when the light reflects back here, okay, it is passed back to the detector. And the reference light here, the same, the same thing happens. The reflected light from the reference beam will be uh, uh, collected here. Information will then be stored here and analyzed later in the computer. So OCT is basically a biopsy of the retina optically. 
without actually having to cut out the retina or cut out the eye. So what we see helps us to make a diagnosis and also monitoring of the retina. This is basically the fundus of a human's retina. And this bit here, just to remind everyone, that this is the macula, and the right in the center bit is the fovea. So OCT scan primarily captures image of this, and it gives us a histological, as good as a histopathological uh, image of the macula. This slide here, the y-axis uh, shows the uh, penetration of different kind of modalities of imaging, whereas the, the, the x-axis here shows the different types of uh, imaging. There are at least six uh, imaging systems here, MRI, high resolution, CT scan, ultrasound, uh, ultra high resolution, OCT versus conventional OCT, and confocal microscopy. This pendulum basically shows, the larger it is, it shows uh, less resolution, the smaller it is, the better the resolution, and the longer it is, it penetrates deeper. You can see OCT resides here, okay? Varies between one to 10 microns, whereas ultrasound is about 150 microns. Uh, being a corneal surgeon, the size of a acanthamoeba cyst, when somebody gets an uh, infection of the cornea, is about, say, about five to six microns. So the conventional OCT is probably not good enough for, the, uh, for that sort of resolution, but probably the high resolution OCT scan can do the trick. So another image of that, that basically uh, reminds us of the different types of modalities of imaging. Things to consider is the resolution, depth of penetration, speed of acquisition, sensitivity. So bear in mind that there's no single modality is ideal for every application, depending on which shot or which, what type of tissues that you want to image, you'll use the correct uh, imaging uh, technique. So the basic principles of OCD is, is quite simple. <clears throat> Remember I mentioned to you about light waves being emitted by uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, low wave uh, beam. So basically it's based on interferometry. The technique is to, to analyze the uh, reflected waves and to see if they are uh, in the same phase or opposite phase. If they're in the opposite phase, they cancel each other. So you've got a flat line. Whereas if they are in uh, the same phase, they're additional to, 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 uh, to each other and you can see uh, uh, amplification. So just to reca uh, uh, recap, the source of light will come from this box, which is called the low coherence source light. So light will come up from this, split into two beams. One goes into the reference beam. One goes into the reference uh, mirror. Another one goes into the uh, sample of the retina. So when the reflected lights come back into the coupler, it's passed back into the detector, and then uh, further analysis is performed. So when we look at an OCT scan of this macula, is actually composed of multiple A scans, okay? So uh, eventually this is compute, uh, uh, collect, collected and analyzed as a B scan. So a B scan is made up of uh, multiple A scans. So when I was training uh, more than 15 years ago, this is what we get. The uh, quality of the image is rather poor, uh, but it still gives us a approximate or rough idea of what's going on. So you can see here, uh, time domain OCD scan is one of the first uh, available uh, technology back then. It measures about 400 scans per second. Currently we have two uh, technology that can measure 26,000 scans per second. And the resolution has improved to as small as five microns. Uh, in that context, it's actually faster than eye movement, so it can actually uh, take into account of eye movement as an artifact, and that's taken a, a, into account when the image of the OCD scan is produced on the computer screen. So one has to uh, remember that there's something called axial and transverse resolution. The axial resolution is determined by the light source, whereas the transverse resolution is determined by the optics of the eye. So on the far left, we have gone through the basics of time domain OCT. The Fourier domain OCT is comprised of a spectral domain and swept source OCT uh, uh, technology. So suffice to know that 
remember I mentioned to you that there's a reference mirror here. This actually moves about uh, to actually compensate for the reflected light. But this, uh, this system here has got a fixed position reference mirror and therefore uh, there's less sort of a movement to compensate for the reflected light. Uh, as such, uh, the, the, the speed of capturing is actually improved and therefore the quality of image is much, much better. Someone's going on. Oh, I'm not moving forward. Okay, so uh, basically the color coding in OCTs. If some, if, uh, if some of you have got an OCD machine that actually has got colors in it, I just want to go through with you. Anything that's red, uh, white or red, it shows there's hyper reflectivity, such as nerve fiber layers, or the RPE or corneal capillaries. The low reflective ones, we know that they are dark, say the vitreous, the vitreous in the vitreal cavity, uh, or hemorrhage blood, or choroid or photoreceptors. Sorry about the error in smelling. Anything in between, the intermediate, uh, uh, intermediate reflectivity is basically by the uh, intermediate layers of the uh, neurosensory retina, such as the uh, uh, outer or inner plexiform layers. So again, this is a larger image. It tells us that uh, the RPE cells, the, neuro, the nerve fiber layers, they are quite reflective. Therefore, they've got uh, colors of red, whereas with the vitreous, uh, the photoreceptors are rather dark. They have got low reflectivity. And anything in between, they are green in colors, such as inner outer plexiform layer. I would like to share with you uh, the, the uh, I'd like to share with you these two pictures that compares the, the standard uh, spectral domain OCT scan and the swept source OCT scan. You can see here, this is still a very beautiful picture. You can see the, uh, the foveal pit here. You can see the multiple layers of the retina. Uh, for those of you who, are, who know, basically there are nine layers of the retina. Whereas you look at the image below here, you can actually see more. You can see as, as if there's some uh, kind of smoke, smoky appearance here. That's basically the uh, collagen fibers of the uh, vitreous. And those dark areas, uh, some people will call it bursa premacularis. It's just like a bursa here. Uh, so, and not, or not only that, it can cap uh, uh, capture the image in front of the retina, but it can actually give us information behind the RPE cells. You can see that there's, there's a little shadow here and there's a faint line going through here. That basically is the choroid. Uh, in this part of the world, in, in, in Malaysia or in Japan or in the Far East, polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy is a rather prevalent disease. And a lot of research has gone in to study uh, this bit of the choroid. Thicker of, uh, of, uh, of a choroid is called pachychoroid, whereby it can be associated with uh, pathologies such as uh, PCV. So other than the swept source or the foreign domain, there's another uh, technique to improve the imaging of the choroid. This is just to share with you. Basically, move the objective lens of the uh, spectral domain OCD closer to the eye. And this was actually done about eight years ago. So I would like to show you this beautiful swept source OCD scan of somebody's uh, eye with, uh, well, guess it. Basically, this patient has got diabetic retinopathy, the proliferative type where there's uh, pre-retinal fibrovascular proliferation and vitreal uh, retinal uh, uh, traction. At the same time, the photoreceptors are all visual, the photoreceptor layers are visualized and you can see the choroid is actually uh, uh, viewed here. Uh, technology is advancing all the time. We can also see that uh, uh, the OCT machines are actually integrating what we call uh, scanning laser ophthalmoscopy. Basically, it can produce confocal imaging of the uh, ultra structures of our, of our retina. So therefore, this is now called the C scan. The, high, the resolution will be much, much, much higher. Uh, so a spin-off is that it's used in cardiovascular and gastrointestinal in a specialty. So I will just uh, have a slide on OCT and geography. Since OCT scan can capture all the uh, ultra structures of the retina, 
Uh, it can use uh, technology of OCT to capture the microvasculature of the retina and the choroid. So this was actually first uh, published back in 2014. It uses laser light reflectance of the surface of moving red blood cells uh, to accurately depict vessels. So later on, I'll have a case to, to depict that. I will tell you the advantage and also the potential limitation of this technology. So this slide itself basically uh, shows the progress of time of uh, the birth, uh, the maturity of the OCT imaging uh, machines. Back in 1990, OCT machines were still at its infancy. Uh, names like uh, Fujimoto, David Huang, they are the pioneers in actually coming up with this uh, uh, technology. So it's not till actually year 2002, when actually, uh, it's not till year 2002. And I request that everyone try to mute their, uh, their, their computer uh, so that I can have an uninterrupted uh, presentation. That will be much appreciated, thank you. So this slide basically shows the uh, progress of time of uh, the OCT technology. You can see on the far left, uh, OCT scan was at its infancy. The uh, images were quite crude. Uh, as we progress in time, the uh, imaging has much better resolution and the size of the machine is actually getting smaller as well. So you can see here that in year 2002 onwards, there's an explosion of OCD technology, so much so that they, uh, it's, uh, 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 it's also a spin-off for, uh, for subspecialty like dermatology and gastroenterology. So year 2005, you can see the uh, sudden increase in uh, companies, number of companies showing great interest in uh, OCT imaging, uh, and you can see the estimated annual, predicted annual income of OCD market as, as much as uh, potentially 5 billion USD. So if anyone's interested in this uh, kind of investment, you should look uh, deeply into it. Okay. So I'll leave you with this last image uh, that potentially we can have a machine that can, at the press of a button, will capture the OCT of our eye structure from the front to the back. And it could be potentially a screening system uh, whereby yeah. people like yourself in the, in the high street working as, as optometrist, as optician, can actually help patients to diagnose with, uh, uh, to diagnose their specific eye conditions. Okay, so without further ado, I would like to pass the stage back to Dr. Wong Jun Shen. Uh, I look forward to his uh, talk on the types of retinal diseases. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ho. Thank you, Dr. Ho. Uh, I'd like to remind anybody who's not speaking to mute their, their phone or their computer so that we can have a clarity. Uh, can I share my screen? Uh, Dr. Ho, can you unshare yours? Yeah. Okay, I know some of you just came late. So just to recap, the first uh, 10 minutes or so, Dr. Uh, Ho has really given us a very uh, good overview of the development and the uh, technology showcase. So I'm now here going to talk about the uh, diagnostic approach and I'm going to use uh, common retinal diseases that you may encounter a lot in your practices. Uh, and I want you to come up from this session understanding what are the uh, common uh, conditions and how the uh, OCT can help you interpret. So this is just a basic anatomy. We are concerned about this layer here at the back of the eye called retina. Of course, you all know this. And this is how a normal retina should look like on a color uh, photography. The uh, segment that we are always interested in looking at is the posterior pole or the macular region. Now, OCT gives us a cross-section cross of this part of the eye. All right, this is the optic nerve. And what Dr. Ho has mentioned earlier, uh, you, this uh, OCT allows us to see a histology or tissue cross-section of the retina. Okay. And this is a first generation or second generation OCT, a color representation, and which is, of course, you can see is very crude but you can see roughly the structure in cross-section in real time. 
However, nowadays, I think all the machines that you purchase off the market are actually of a high resolution, whether they are most, most of them are white cost spectral domain. So you can see multiple layers of the retinal structure. This is the vitreous, which is black in color. You can see the interface of the vitreous uh, jelly here, where there is attachment to the macula. And these are solid jelly, and underneath here is liquid jelly. The fiber layer, the, uh, all the in, uh, inner and outer layers of retina. And these two parallel lines are very important. This is actually the, uh, we call it ellipsoid zone, or this is where the integrity of the photoreceptors are. If you have broken the lines here, that means that you have damage in the photoreceptors. And this outer solid white line here, is the uh, retinal pigment epithelium. So in other words, this is the full thickness of the uh, nervous retina layer. This is a retinal pigment epithelium and underneath that, the Brooks membrane and all the, uh, uh, this would be constitute the, uh, the wall of the eye itself, right, part of the sclera. So obviously this is a spongy appearance, it's due to a lot of vasculature, a lot of uh, choreo capillaries, you call it. And so if there's any pathology uh, that comes from under the retina, you can see a breakthrough from here. So I recommend that uh, even if your machine can give you false color, the best way to interpret the, retin uh, the uh, OCT is to use black and white because it can give you superior resolution without the clouding of the colors. Colors looks beautiful to your eyes, but you may lose some resolution. Okay, what are the common diseases I want to go through today? We'll talk about, uh, I'm going to skip some, all right? Um, we are going to concentrate on diabetic retinopathy, macular degeneration, ocular vein occlusions, and epiretinal membrane and macular hole. Now, generally, just to recap, since most of you are primary care provider uh, in the eye problem, retinal symptoms are usually can occur as a sudden or rapid loss in vision. They can be preceded by floaters or flashes. You may have central vision loss. That means that you can see from the peripheral part, but not the central part. If any distortion in your vision, whether lines are crooked or image looks uh, uh, some, some, some magnification or minification, uh, they are, doesn't look normal, there's probably be a macular problem. However, I just want to warn that early cases of diabetic retinopathy may not present with symptoms until late in the disease. Therefore, they should be uh, uh, examined by eye doctors. Now, about 10% of patients in our population, probably a bit more in Malaysia, about 16% are diabetic. And at any time in cross-section, if you look at diabetic eyes, patient with diabetes, 30% of some form of retinopathy. And this is the most common cause of blindness in adult population. And in ophthalmology, we classify the diabetic retinopathy into two main types, which is one, non-proliferative. Non means they have no blood, abnormal blood vessels. Or proliferative means there's a growth of abnormal blood vessels. And all this can coexist with a condition called macular edema. Macular edema just refers to the swelling in the macular layer, all right? So this is a typical uh, picture of a non proliferative diabetic retinopathy. You can see there are a lot of what I call dots and blots. These are micro uh, uh, neurisms or even hemorrhages, all right, that is, uh, occur in the small blood vessels in the eye called capillaries. You have leakage of content from blood vessels, like all these yellow exudates. They are actually proteins or uh, uh, fats that leak up from the eye. And because, as you see the diagram of the eye, the macula is the lowest part of the eye because it's a spherical, like a ball. So most of these leakages will track into the fovea. All right, you can see that they tend to track underneath here. At this point in time, this patient may still have a 20, 20 or 6, 6 vision because the macula is relatively healthy, it's not swollen. All right, so this is again just another image. So if you see, if on your color uh, uh, fundus uh, uh, screening, you can see all these dots and dots. You should actually tell the patient that the eye is not very good already. As they become more severe, they can see all these like fluffy yellow things. These are not ex these are what we call soft exudates because as uh, contrast to the hard little yellow dots here. Soft exudates are actually area of a nerve infarct. That means that the uh, nerve layer on the retina is uh, deprived of oxygen, and they get they get what you call ischemia, and so this is area of uh, nerve uh, capillary blockages. Because there's no abnormal blood vessels, this is still called non-proliferative, and you can see they can progress in severity, 
in this stage, a lot more involvement of the macula has occurred and it's not surprising they start to lose some vision here. And this is where OCT can help you, all right? And this is a typical proliferative diabetic retinopathy. You can see these abnormal blood vessels that start to grow from the uh, vessels, usually around the disc or around the vascular arcades. And these abnormal vessels grow in response to uh, the secretion of a factor in the eye called vascular endothelial growth factor. All right, because the eye is so deprived of oxygen that it fools itself to thinking that the eye must produce factors to compensate, grow more uh, blood vessels. But these abnormal vessels are not very good. All right? They tend to break and they bleed. You can see patches of bleeding here. All right, and they tend to form scar and pull off the retina. In this patient, obviously with a severe disease, the macula is relatively spared, so he may not have symptoms yet except for patchy vision at, vision at the side. So again, same patient, very, very distorted, uh, advanced proliferative diabetic retinopathy. The retina is still uh, adhered to the eye wall, but sometimes the blood can break through, and this is called vitreous hemorrhage. You can see that the jelly is full of blood, so vision suddenly lose a lot of vision. But you can still see through this blood is not very dense. You can see optic nerve here. And more often than not, if it's neglected, all right, scar tissue would always form in attendance with the uh, abnormal blood vessels. And this scar tissue here, as you can see, like a semicircular shape here, tend to contract and pull off the retina. And this is the uh, 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 called tractional retinal detachment, and patient would lose even more vision, all right, and then they can get very distorted. So this is a part of a retinal detachment from this tractional scar tissue in diabetic retinopathy and patient obviously have got poor vision. More of the same, very uh, dense protein plug in the macula and also a lot of abnormal blood vessels. Okay, so what happened in this patient who has this uh, very active uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy, in this case, they will have to go for surgery and after surgery, we can restore back most of anatomy. The macula is relatively spared, so vision returns to uh, close to normal. All right, another case before operation here and on the right after operation. Another case where there are a lot of distortion, surgery can restore back if it's done well and early, timely fashion. Okay, the OCT is very important when you're evaluating uh, either non proliferative or proliferative diabetic retinopathy especially when there's no vitreous hemorrhage, you can look through the eye. This is, again, you can see that the retina here is swollen. Remember that usually we can see different layers of retina, and this is the photoreceptor layer. Here you can see that it is swollen up. There are fluid collecting underneath the, the uh, uh, retina layer, we call subretinal fluid. And within the retina itself, you can see all these black cysts here, this rarefaction of the darkening of a substance in the nerve layer means that there are a lot of fluid inside the retina. That's why we call diabetic macular edema. So if the fovea in this case is affected, patient will lose moderate amount of vision. So they can have maybe 612, 624, or 648 vision. All right. So this is very edematous here. And then this is another example. You can see that there are cyst collection of fluid inside. All right. So there's distortion of the inner uh, architecture of the different nerve layer. You can see also all these white dots we call high, hyper reflective uh, dots. This is probably thought to be uh, some of the activated microglial cells, a certain amount of uh, type of cells inside the eye, which is correspondent, uh, which is present in inflammation of the eye. So diabetic macular edema is also an inflammatory response in the eye because it's an injury to the eye. But if we can get rid of all these edema, this patient can see reasonably well because we can see that the uh, integrity of the photoreceptors, the white lines on the outside, all right, not the uh, outermost, uh, are relatively preserved so they do not have disruption of the uh, uh, photoreceptors. So they have potential to see well again. All right? Again, another patient where there is a big cyst in the center of fovea, all right, and then still good integrity on the uh, retinal uh, photoreceptor layer. So by treating this, we can actually reverse uh, poor vision. Okay, sometimes your OCT can give you a map. You can use a map to have a, give you a guide. You know, there's a focal swelling here. This is the uh, 
the pit, this is a three dimension map. Uh, the pit here is the fovea, and depends on where you cut through. Here we cut through here, you can see there's just a fovea swelling here. And if we treat this patient, for example, in this patient, vision 638, when we start treating with anti regf injection, uh, July to September, vision improved from 638 to 612, and you can see there's a thickening become less. But if you stop treatment, they become thicken again. So you have to retreat and the vision drop. So diabetic retinal uh, with macular edema uh, responds very well for intensive uh, injection of, uh, into the eye, anti regf injection. I can see the same patient, repeated injection after a year of treatment. Uh, the uh, macular uh, is, uh, anatomy is restored and vision fluctuates depends on whether there's recurrence. So they need about one to two years of treatment before they are stabilized. And this is just a patient when last saw in April 20, uh, uh, 2015. Vision is 6 to 8 due to cataract, but the anatomy of the uh, retina is restored. So at the time, I do not want to treat anymore. So in other words, just to summarize diabetic retinopathy, vision loss is largely preventable, uh, but you need timely uh, uh, assessment. Uh, they should schedule an eye examination upon diagnosis of diabetes because sometimes they already have changes in the eye and they often should see an ophthalmologist at least once a year. So the uh, role of optician is that if you have a facial diabetes and your OCT shows their changes, send them to your nearest eye doctor who can treat as soon as possible. Now the other uh, issue, uh, the other topic I'm going to talk about is uh, age-related macular degeneration. This is also very common. Macular just being a spot, right? This is macular, this is back of the eye. And again, the degeneration is at this layer where you can have uh, abnormal blood vessels break through under the RP layer into the substance under the retina or into the retinal substance. And these uh, abnormal blood vessels will leak fluid and blood into the retina and disrupt the function of the retina. Again, this is a normal retina. Because this is a macular degeneration, you lose central vision. All right? This is a very common condition, especially in people of 50 years and above. So one of the early signs is distortion in vision. This is the AMSA grid. If a normal vision, the, the patient should see regular grid. But in this case, sorry, in this case, uh, you can have a distortion or also a, a blind spot from the uh, macular degeneration. So, and in the elderly, all right, apart from uh, patients who are at risk of diabetes, this is probably one of the most common uh, problem, all right, uh, in a developed world because cataract. It's not a big problem because it's reversible. Okay, it's just to, uh, to summarize, this is what uh, the symptoms of the uh, patient with macular degeneration. And so they have difficulty reading, telling the face, uh, whose face is that, hard to drive and hard to tell the time. Now, AMD, or the short for age-related macular degeneration, is categorized in two stages. Fortunately, most people have a, what you call early stage or what you call dry AMD. Why you call it dry? Because they have only uh, abnormality in the pigment or deposit of this yellow thing at the RPE or retinal pigment epithelium layer called drusen. There's no abnormal blood vessel, there's no leakage. However, this has progressed to a wet type here where there are either leakage from the blood vessels or these abnormal blood vessels start to grow under retinal and bleed and eventually it will cause the scarring and permanent damage to the eye. So this is uh, actually a dry stage where you see a lot of uh, yellow deep deposit. If you do an OCT scan, you don't see any uh, uh, distortion or retinal layer itself, but you can see little, little humps of uh, elevation on the RPE le level, uh, which represent this drusen, which is the waste product accumulation on the RPE level. This patient has a scar. So when they have a scar like that, vision is not good. All right? This is from advanced AMD when they have really black. Another scar. Okay, sometimes before they have a uh, loose vision, as they progress into a uh, wet stage, they can have uh, a swelling under the RPE layer. That means that collection of fluid here, like a blister here, you can see this round blister on the retinal pigment epithelium. All right, again, a blister. You can see that this is in three dimension, it's actually like a dome shape. You can see the underlying retinal layer over overlying it. So that's why everything, the blood vessels runs across it. So many patients may have a bit of distortion and they may not have uh, visual loss at this stage unless it's accompanied by uh, uh, 
abnormal blood vessels. Here, you can see a bean-shaped pigment epithelial uh, uh, detachment. If you do an OCT, you can see that the eye wall doesn't run across here. The eye wall is pushed up. All right? So that's why the collection of fluid, the black color is fluid, is under the retina, under the uh, retinal pigment epithelium. So the retina is just pushed upwards. There's no distortion in the retina itself. Therefore, they do not lose vision. At most, they have some distortion in lines or lines appear a bit wavy. Now, if they have got symptoms, that means that they become distortion, we would treat as if they have wet AMD. If there are no distortion, vision is still good. We just observe until they have a problem. All right. So what problem? They can get bleeding under the retina. You can see it's under retina because the overlying blood vessels is clearly seen. This is deep under the uh, retinal layer. So it's subretinal hemorrhage. Okay, another picture. And when they come uh, with this uh, problem, all right, they lose center vision. We call that choroidal neo vascularization because you have abnormal blood vessels that come from choroid. Here sometimes it can be very massive. You can have a lot more blood under the retina and they lose more vision except peripheral vision. And this is also an, some altered blood. When uh, blood is more than a few weeks old, it becomes uh, yellowish and brownish because the pigment will start to be uh, lost. And this is altered uh, blood in a wet AMD. Okay, so this is sometimes you may not have blood, but you can see proteins accumulation we call exudates that is leaking out from these abnormal blood vessels underneath here. This is almost a scar here. And this is when we have seen leakages like that, this is a, a proxy for active disease. All right, so we need to treat this patient. And this is again blood here. Some uh, in our Asian population, you'd be surprised a lot of patients has a very good uh, appearance in the phyllo eye, but they have very advanced disease here. You can see that this is the spot where the uh, uh, abnormal blood vessels grow, just slightly off the fovea, but because of bleeding from these abnormal blood vessels, it affects the fovea and vision would be affected. So by getting rid of this blood surgically, we can actually save vision. Okay, in the old days to diagnose the abnormal blood vessels with CNV, we can use angiogram, but OCT, this is how angi angiogram looks like. If we do a normal angiogram, there should not be any fluorescence in the center because there's no blood vessels there. All the fluorescence should contain the capillaries and blood vessels. But if we have abnormal fluorescence here, that means that this is a tuft of abnormal blood vessels. You take out the dye and the black here is a masking from the blood. So this is a proof that there is abnormal blood vessels here. And so we need to treat. But because we know that OCT gives us a cross-section, we can use that to visualize. So this is a the first generation OCT, you can see the swelling here and this layer here represent abnormal blood vessels under the retina and causing all these uh, leakages and some blood here. So in AMD, the uh, OCT can give us cross-section and look at the, uh, uh, the uh, structure and the uh, appearance of the macula so we can actually diagnose uh, the uh, problem confidently. Nowadays, we can diagnose with high, con uh, high resolution OCT without the need uh, for angiogram in most cases. For example, this patient, this is a CNV. Why I say that it's a CNV, you can see that there's a breach in the uh, retinal pigment epithelium and this is abnormal blood vessels in here is quite dense here in terms of hyperrefractivity, start to grow into the substances of the retinal and there's a disruption in the architecture of the uh, retina itself here. All right, after treatment, you can see that this become consolidated, it become it's shrunken, it become a scar tissue, but uh, you would get back some vision, although may not get 100% uh, good vision because there are some residual destruction of the uh, outer layer of retina. And here you can see that the proof to show that this is AMD is that you lose the continuity of the RPE because all these abnormal blood vessels must come by definition from under the RPE, that is from the eye wall. These abnormal choroidal new vessels grow into the under the retina or into the retina itself and leak causing all this cyst accumulation of fluid. So you know that because of destruction under the, uh, the uh, RPE, this is a choroidal problem. This is an age graded macular degeneration. But with treatment, okay, you can see that they start to have a restoration of integrity of RPE here. All right? Although they are still uh, some, it's no longer regular and some of this has become scar. All right? so, you can actually treat them with intravitreal injection and you try to restore back good anatomy and vision, uh, just how you gain vision.
with a timely injection, but you need a, probably an average of seven to eight injections a year, almost initially every month, uh, you can see good gain in vision and they sustain over 24 months in this trial here, uh, an average of five to six factor gain uh, if you treat them from baseline. All right? But if you do not treat them, this is the uh, control, they tend to lose vision. So after two years, the differential in the, in the uh, vision uh, is almost 20 letters. All right? So that's why it is very effective if you treat them. Uh, so in conclusion, AMD is also an important cause of blindness and this can be easily detected with OCT and treatment with anti-VEGF is very effective. So therefore, uh, it is uh, sometimes uh, the responsibility falls upon you to uh, pick up if they come and see you for poor vision and send them to the eye doctor. In doubt, always send to eye doctor, all right? If you can't refract them, always send to eye doctor. Now, the other common condition, a few more conditions I want to cover before we end is that retinal vessel occlusion. Here I concentrating, I'm concentrating on vein occlusion because if your arterial occlusion is usually not treatable, all right? Vein occlusion, because uh, usually it's very dramatic. If you look at the eye, there are a lot of blood that spills out from the, the uh, drainage uh, vein here. All the vein drains back to the uh, optic nerve in the retina and they have sectors that drain into all these uh, uh, veins. So this sector is bleedy because it's blocked. So just like a, a drain or long gang that's blocked, right? The water will overflow. This uh, pressure builds up in the block area and blood will spill out. And the segment that is not draining would be uh, relatively damaged, all right? Here, this segment is damaged. And this patient comes to see us because the, the uh, macula is involved, so he can report there is something wrong with the vision, all right? And you can see here, this the blockage is in a hemi, superior uh, the top hemi uh, hemi uh, sphere of the uh, retina so this is called uh, hemi vein occlusion but there's also early occlusion on the bottom part because the two occlusion of a different severity you can see the, the severity of the bleeding that few spill out from the blood vessels is quite different All right again this is just a branch here and then you can get this sector that's involved the rest of the eye is not involved and because there's no Literally no flow or slow flow of blood in the blood vessel. The uh, retina here is that also partly damaged from lack of oxygenation. Therefore, you can see these yellow spots here, which is an infarct of the uh, oxygen uh, of the nerve uh, nerve fiber layer. Okay, once it's resolved, all right, you can see that it because uh, uh, the all the initial swelling is gone. It, you can go back to quite normal anatomy, but a good eye doctor would know that there's something wrong here in the past because you can see the collateral that, uh, blood vessels that develop and also there are some abnormality in the capillaries here if you look carefully. Okay, again, a small branch retinal vein occlusion. Okay, and start to resolve. Okay, this is the central retinal vein occlusion before it starts to spill out. All the blood vessels become very twiggly and very uh, tortuous, very uh, uh, crooked because of the high pressure in the obstruction. And then this is a central retinal vein occlusion somewhere here. So all the venous circulation is occluded. And this is another occlusion, worse occlusion in the central vein. Now, how does it affect? Because when there's no flow, uh, one of the uh, effects is that you get macular edema. All right, again, same thing. The pathology is thought to be not just a mechanical effect, it's due to uh, uh, vascular endothelial growth factor mediated process because there's a relatively starvation of oxygen in the nerve, nerve uh, fiber layer in the retina and the retina would create this uh, growth factor called vascular endothelial growth factor. So that growth factor causes swelling and leakiness of the blood vessels and cause edema here. All right. So again, just like what I showed earlier in diabetic, all right, once you have edema, uh, you can get disruption in the retinal layer, the subretinal fluid here. You can see that this is not a choroidal new vascular, new, new vascular process because the retinal pigment epithelium is intact. All right? It's not a choroidal process. It's not something that originates from underneath uh, the, eye, uh, the eye wall. All right? So once you treat them, you can get good resolution. All right? So when the fluid has gone back, you'll be surprised how much uh, restoration and architecture we can 
we can achieve and therefore vision improve dramatically. So the key is to diagnose that they have a problem here. Don't sit on it. You have to treat all right, with anti-regif injection. With treatment, again, same thing. This is a branch retinomic occlusion. From baseline, you can gain on the average about up to 20 lectures on your vision chart all right, after 12 months of treatment. And this seems to sustain over the next 12 months. And if you look at a central vein occlusion, again, with treatment, very good results too. Share means there's no treatment. They're not so good. And this is sustained also over 24 months. Okay, so remember, if patient has vascular uh, occlusion, we have to look for risk factors. Why should they get uh, a so-called stroke in the eye, a blockage in the blood vessel of the eye? Do they have glaucoma, all right? We know that glaucoma increases the risk of blockage. Do they have systemic risk? Sorry for the typo. This patient diabetic, hypertensive, any blood clotting disorder. Do they have high cholesterol, etc.? So we normally send them to the physician to evaluate all this and control whatever uh, underlying risk factors and we can treat with anti regf early. And then if they are very ischemic, sometimes we use laser treatment. Now, uh, the last two conditions I'm going to briefly go through is what you call epiretinal membrane. If you have seen enough macular, you know this is not right, all right? There seems to be a semi-transparent sheen that grows on the surface of macular, and this sheen contracts so that it cocks, it cocks through or make the uh, blood, tiny blood vessels near the, near the uh, macular region to be distorted, all right? You can see that all this cock screwing, and you can even see stress lines, all right? So that's a semi-transparent scar layer that grow on the surface, all right? This is on the surface of retina, at the junction of the retina, first nerve fiber layer, and the vitreous. This is very common, especially in elderly, uh, in female, and especially if patient has got inflammation of the eye in the past, or had received treatment of the retina before, all right? So it caused, uh, distortion of macular, we call macular pucker, all right? So this is used interchangeably. Again, you can see that there's a dense yellow uh, scar over here on the surface of retina, and it causes straightening of the blood vessels, all right? This vessel, blood vessels, again, these two blood vessels are pulled towards the macular region, and they're all straightened, and it causes distortion. So the symptoms would be, patient would see blurriness and also distortion in their straight lines. Okay, again, another uh, good example of a uh, epiretinal membrane causing macular pucker. This is before operation. And once we remove them with surgery, we can restore back the architecture of the macula. And you see the cock screwing of the little blood vessels here has disappeared. And vision uh, distortion would be decreased. Although they sometimes cannot come back to normal, they can see great improvement in their vision. Now, how does it look on OCT? All right, this is actually the macular region. You remember, macula is supposed to be a, a, a valley here, a trough here. So this is the cross-section of the membrane, all right? So membrane, sometimes they are devoid in the center. They just grow around an opening in the center here. And because the membrane pulls on the retina, the retina split open. But this is not a full thickness split, right? It's split, uh, we call it a lamellar hole here. And of course, the distortion of this macular region causes distortion in your vision. You can see that. The abnormal attachment of the retinal surface to the uh, membrane, all right? This is causing this uh, uh, sawtooth-like appearance here. And the contraction of this membrane is the one who caused the swelling of the retina and distortion, all right? When they're distorted, you can get cyst formation. So it's like macular edema, okay? So you can see here one big layer of a uh, dense membrane on the left OCT here with the uh, abnormal tattering of a uh, retina onto the membrane. And if you look at a map, uh, an uh, on map of the uh, thickness of the retina, this white and red area here is a uh, thick, represent the thickened retina, and this is where the membrane is. One month after post-op, we have removed, uh, evidently uh, removed the uh, white membrane from here. You start to see some restoration of the uh, architecture of the no fiber layer now in the retina and vision start to improve. Over time, it may come back to a bit of a uh, normal anatomy. Sometimes it never come back to normal, but even then they have good uh, uh, improvement in vision. All right? Here, another pre and post-op. You can see the membrane here. So if you do an OCT on the epiretinal membrane, 
if you look carefully, you can always see this line here. And you can always see the edema on the macula. That means uh, the loss of this contour, all right? And if patient have a moderate vision loss, you see this on your OCT, you know that you are into something already, okay? But because there's a good uh, architecture, the outer part of the retina is not uh, compromised, uh, you can actually good, get good vision. Again, I emphasize this is not AMD because there's no bridge in the RPE. So very simple, a lot of people get confused. They see this, they want to inject anti jeff No, this is not a macular degeneration. This is a mechanical problem, all right, from the membrane. You need surgery to remove the membrane and the edema would uh, restore. So one thing is look at whether there's a breach in the RPE layer. Yeah. Again, another patient, you can see that also lost uh, the contour of the, uh, of the uh, macular region. No breakage in the RPE. This is not macular degeneration. This is epiretinal membrane causing a swelling and distortion in the retina before operation, after operation. Again, another epiretinal membrane, all right? causing this nerve to be split, pulled apart, but there's no full thickness break. If you remove that, it will start to restore by itself, all right? So we just improve from 6 12 after operation. This is November, December, by March, they can get good vision, all right? The only thing is that I sometimes see even ophthalmologists treat this for uh, AMD and they give them multiple injections, obviously, to no avail, and there was uh, some uh, loss in time for not treating the uh, eye promptly, okay? So now another condition that you may pick up on the uh, related to epiretinal membrane is that you may see the attraction. If you can see carefully, I'm not sure whether it appear on your screen. There's this line. This is the interface of where the uh, vitreous jelly gets stuck to the retinal uh, macular region. And this is like a V-shaped uh, pattern. And because the retina, you know, vitreous contracts, sometimes it pull on the retina and cause attraction here. This patient may be asymptomatic, but when we see this, we would watch them carefully because to see if there is any distortion all right, uh, in the retina and cause visual problem. If there is, for example, you can see here, there is a broad adherence to the uh, macular region by the vitreous jelly. This, this is vitreous itself. This is under the vitreous. And it causes distortion here and some cyst formation. If it's not symptomatic, we watch. If symptomatic, that means they are losing some vision, 6, 12 or worse. Or if they have got a, a distortion in vision, you do surgery to remove them. All right, you can see that the patient we watch, but two years later, you can see that it is starting to contract, but it's still pull on the retina. And this, this time, a uh, patient is more symptomatic. We were watching it because there were no symptoms. And then because of that symptoms, we do an operation and the... Uh, we, this is post uh, vitrectomy one month later. There's no more pooling on the retina. Okay, so this is another patient, 6 9 vision. We know there's adhesion, we watch. About three years later, before he becomes symptomatic, because there's still adhesion of the vitreous here and start to distort, vision has dropped. We do operation September 2020, November, restore back to 6 6 vision because there's no more traction on the macular region. All right. So this is very easily picked up from your OCT. Sometimes they have, uh, you don't have to do operation, we just watch. That's why I said we want to see sometimes there are no symptoms for years. Uh, sometimes it can resolve spontaneously because the adhesion start to break loose and there's no more traction on the retina. This is over four months. We call it VMT stands for vitro macular traction symptom. All right. So again, this is a... Uh, so that's why I say that it is uh, related to epiretinal membrane. Sometimes the uh, membrane is actually a condensation of the vitreous jelly interface on the uh, retinal uh, uh, nerve layer and vitreous interface where it's taken. So here obviously it causes thickening, but because it's not symptomatic, we will watch, we will observe only. That means that doesn't mean that every case you need to do surgery, but over 18 months, there's spontaneous resolution. This uh, membrane, which is a uh, condensate of the vitreous interface break free by itself. It's no longer attached to retina. And so vision, uh, there was spontaneous resolution. There's no more risk for ERM, epiretinal membrane formation or traction of retina. Again, I just want to show you that not all ERM needs to be removed. You can see this, uh, it looks scary, but vision is 6-6, six, six, right? There's a bit of splitting there, but vision is still good. We know there is something 
from retinal membrane. But because the uh, asymptomatic time is on our side, you can watch. Here I watch it from 2010 to 2020. 10 years, still 6 6 vision. So it knows that if I intervene in 2010, I would have done no additional favor or service to this eye, all right, except for unnecessary operation. So the key is that I understand there's something going on and monitor it with, with a, a patient symptoms and OCT because I can still do operation later on if it's symptomatic. Same here, just because there are some membrane there, a bit of a thickening of the macula doesn't mean, all right, uh, you must do something. This patient, 2010 to 2019, vision about the same, so why should I do something, all right? And this patient uh, complains. And a related condition called macular hole. Macular hole happens is when you have the traction on the macula and that has caused a full thickness break. Here, if you look at it in a, a three-dimension photo, you can see a thickness like a low bump in the, in the uh, macular region. Here you can see it better. You can see the epiretal membrane around that. All right, you can see that just as I mentioned. Because it starts to pull on the retina tangentially and a hole has opened up in the macula. Obviously, when you have a defect in the macula, you don't see well. All right. So after operation, removing that uh, traction and the, the holes close together. So one of the uh, macular formation is that when you have traction on the retina, you, you start to have cysts, but not all will develop a full thickness hole. We have to monitor. So once the, the full thickness hole is uh, formed like this. Now, how do you know it's full thickness? There's no longer any outer retinal substance here. All right. I told you that last dense line is not retinal, it's a retinal pigment epithelium, all right? So this is the demarcation between retina, uh, anything inside here, I mean, on top here is retina, this is RPE, and this is the sclera, choral capillaries. So there's, this is a full thickness hole because there's nothing in between here. So if you have full thickness hole, you need operation. If you have partial thickness, you can have good vision. I show you earlier examples in the, some of the ERF where they are being pulled apart, but there's no good vision. Uh, you don't have to operate. Here, we need to operate to put them together, all right? Here, you can see the traction on one end of the, uh, one edge of the retina. Big gap, nothing here, no more uh, photoreceptors, just RPE, all right? Here, you have to remove the traction and push them back together with the gas, using a gas uh, insertion into the eye, okay? And this is one month. It doesn't close totally, but you can see that it's coming together already. Okay, this is another pre-op. The larger the hole is harder for it to meet together, but here we can join them back after the surgery. Okay, another example, pre-op 660, post-op 630. Sometimes they may not come back to 100%, but it's still uh, three lines improvement on the chart. All right, they can, patient can appreciate that. Another one, counting finger only, because there is a split in the full thickness. There's a retina, the retina is being drawn apart and there's actually also splitting the nerve fiber layer here. But with operation, we can put, put them together. At least now we can see 638. Another example, 660, full thickness hole again, joined together, 612. Sometimes, rarely, all right, when the uh, traction on the retina, like I said, we know that sometimes we trust the uh, traction can free itself spontaneously. And this patient, actually was seen in 2016 with a small hole but refused surgery. But when I saw again in 2017, one year later, yes, because the traction, the gel has separated from the adhesion on the macula, the macula can close spontaneously. That's why I say all these are related. Vitreous macular traction is a, uh, can cause epiretinal membrane and cause macular hole. So they are related condition. So OCT allows us to diagnose confidently what's going on. Another spontaneous, uh, spontaneous closure, you can see part of the retinal uh, substance is being pulled off by the contracting jelly here. So it causes a whole full thickness. But because there's no more uh, traction on this retina itself, sometimes it closes back together. All right, this is over a year period. Now, before you develop a macular hole, some people would just have some split on the retina. And this is more common, all right, in a highly short-sighted eye, all right, because the eye is uh, the abnormal length of the eyeball cause a stress on the back of the eye. But not all retinal schisis, or we call a split in the retina, cause a visual problem. Here, six, eight years, all right, no problem. 2012 to 2020, so we just see there's no changes. So for a lot of macular schisis, 
how do you know there's no problem? Like I always tell you, look at the outer retinal layer. There is substances of retina here. Nothing has uh, disrupted over here. Just the inner layer has split. So it doesn't cause a problem in vision. So that's why for eight years, no surgery done. Not, not only not done, no need to do surgery and vision is maintained. But we continue to monitor on an annual basis. The last condition I want to talk is uh, called central serous retinopathy. This is very common in young male patients. Young means about in the late 20s, 30s to 50 years old, not the macular degeneration age group, where there is a collection of fluid under the retina. All right? Now, this is not a macular degeneration. As I, can, I tell you earlier, you can see the RPE is still intact. All right? There's no breach in the RPE. There's nothing that grows from under the uh, RPE. Nothing grows from core capillaries. So the key is understand your layers. All right? So a lot of people, they do not understand. They agar agar and make wrong diagnosis. No, after this, you should know this is not macular. This is not an AMD pathology. You have accumulation of fluid. And this is not PED. PED means that this line would be pushed upwards. All right? Underneath here means that collection of fluid is under the RP, uh, retinal pigment detachment. Uh, this is just a collection of fluid under the retina, we call subretinal fluid. And usually they are quite smooth and dome shaped. We call it central serous retinopathy. And in this condition, we do not know why some patients get it. They tend to come and go by itself within three months. Uh, if they cause problem and doesn't go away, then we can treat with a laser treatment. First, we do identify where is the leakage of this fluid come from first. It comes from some of the abnormal blood vessels here. All right? uh, not so much as a bridge, but the function of the uh, RPE for the lead fluid through the RPE itself. All right. Again, if we do angiogram, we can see the leakage is from the RPE here. All right. And we can see that the dye will start to flow up. Okay, this is a gold standard diagnosis, but with if we are confident with the OCT, sometimes we don't need diagnosis. We don't need uh, uh, OCT, all right? Now, one month post, this patient has a chronic uh, central serous retinopathy that doesn't resolve. By, under, by doing an angiogram, we know where the leakage is, just like in, in this case, we know it's leakage. Then we do a special laser called photodynamic laser treatment to this spot, and this would reverse the leakage of the dye, and they would clear it up within a month, all right? So... A lot of them, once they're cleared up, they can restoration of anatomy, but there may be still some residual uh, uh, distortion over there. Therefore, although they can get good improvement, sometimes they can tell that vision is not, never 100%. Another patient with a swelling here, a dome-shaped blister here, okay, sub collection, uh, a subretinal fluid collection, RPE intact. By doing nothing two months later, right, 6, 9.5, 6, 7.5, two months later, it can resolve spontaneously. All right. No treatment needed, no steroids. A lot of people treat wrongly, they give steroids. Uh, that would only aggravate that. All right. No eye drops needed. And just before I end, there's a special condition called cystoid macular edema. Cystoid macular edema or CME for short, not to be confused with central serous retinopathy. All right. uh, cystoid macular edema is a condition where there's inflammation of the eye and the fluid would accumulate in the nerve fiber layer, the inner part of the no fiber layer causing a we call petaloid pattern like a flower petal pattern so because there's a little cyst here and there we call cystoid macular edema all right on uh, angiogram uh, or on OCT they can see all these uh, little cysts over here 638 this is after uh, I think one of the uh, patient with uh, retinal uh, surgery sometimes because of inflammation from the uh, condition and also from the surgery itself they develop cystoid macular edema, which you can easily pick up from the OCT, and we treat with steroids. This one, we have to treat with steroids, right? Not CSR, and they resolve, and vision gets better. Okay, another view. Normal eye, cystoid macular edema, and this cystoid macular edema with serous retinopathy. So this is not CSR. CSR, you do not, CSR, you do not treat with steroids. This, we treat with steroid eye drops. Okay, so to summarize before I pass back to Dr. Ho, look at your layers carefully, all right? Remember, this is the last 
hyper refractive layer is the RPE. The inner two band are the uh, photoreceptors layers, the, we call the inner outer plexiform, ah, sorry, uh, the uh, cone and the rods, uh, outer layers, all right, ellipsoid zone, all right. So this is a clue to where uh, the, the pathology comes from. Is it under the retina, from the choral capillaries, all right? So look at this carefully, all right? And any disruption of the uh, spaces here sometimes can cause uh, poor prognosis. Thank you very much. Dr. Ho, I return back to you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Dr. Wong, for a very exhaustive, incisive, uh, insightful talk on the retinal diseases. Uh, following on, I would like to share with you some uh, cases. Okay, so some of you may, may, have already, uh, be, may be already doing OCT scan uh, in your practice. So things that you need to think about when you are doing the uh, OCT scan is how to make a value judgment uh, when you're doing a scan for this eye. Uh, you may need to look at the patient as a whole, the age, ethnicity, uh, utilize the fundus reference image. Look at the patient's fundus photo or even the fundus of the patient before you do OCD scan, if permissible. And as what Dr. Wong had mentioned, we need to understand the OCT images. We need to know our lines, okay? Uh, and there, from, that, from there on, we can actually identify the structure and pathology uh, of the uh, scan or the macula and then you link it with the patient's visual symptoms and the history all right now uh, again this is just to recapitulate what uh, dr wong had emphasized the import that we know that there are multiple uh, names to all the nine different layers suffice to say you need to know that this bright light here this bright line here that's the rpe cells layer and then you've got the uh, ellipsoid zone where the uh, photoreceptors are found and then the uh, thinner line above is the external limiting membrane and over here that's the uh, red nerve fiber layer and below it in ganglion cell layer other than that if you can remember them that'd be great but if not these are the few important ones and of course right at the bottom here the spongiform looking that's the uh, choroid capillaries or the choroid so the first case i would like to show you so basically all these cases are collected so that I can share with you the uh, thought process that I, I have when I see this patient. The first patient is a 55 year old lady who had uh, complicated cataract surgery and subsequently her cornea actually decompensated, i.e. it turned cloudy. So there's uh, no two way about it. She needs an exchange of her cornea and perform a penetrating keratoplasty. Three, years late, uh, three months later on her visual her vision is still blurred centrally, despite a moderate amount of astigmatism. So I look at the fundus, uh, the, the disc and look, the, the macula looks relatively normal to me, but I perform an OCT scan. In fact, an OCT scan was already performed preoperatively, but due to the hazy cornea, uh, I was not able to have a, a, a proper or decent image of the uh, macula. As you can see here, I'm just going to recap what Dr. Wall had mentioned to you. There are cystoid changes in the macula. There is collection of fluid under the, underneath the retina, such that this is dome-shaped kind of appearance where the retina is elevated on it. And then the retina as a whole is thickened. So I'll give you two seconds. What did Dr. Wong tell you? What to treat for this patient? Yes, with steroids. So you, this patient needs steroids or non steroid anti-inflammatory drops in order to reduce the swelling. Why? Because this is an inflammation. I think this patient has inflammation stemming from the cataract, complicated cataract surgery that was done a few months, a few years ago. So subsequently, uh, she responded well to uh, just medical treatment with steroids and NSAIDs and her macular and fovea actually improved. So this case actually taught me it's just not good just looking at the front bit of the eye, the cornea, despite having good surgery in, 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 the, in the way of uh, penetrating keratoplasty. This patient still has not shown the appropriate uh, or the commensurate visual improvement because of pathology or abnormality at the back of the eye. A modern OCT imaging technique helps me to diagnose this problem. Second patient is a 72-year-old lady who has reduced vision for uh, about a year plus now and has been uh, 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 afflicted with a uh, distortion or metamorphosia in her central vision. 
So you can see this fundus photo itself showing corkscrew blood vessels. However, there is no hemorrhages whatsoever. So this is not retinal vein occlusion, but an epiretinal membrane. So an OCT scan was shown here. She was seen uh, June last year by myself. And you can see there's pre-retinal or pre-retinal pre proliferation of fibrous tissue with a kind of a well-defined line coming across it. So this is an epiretinal membrane. She underwent past planar vitrectomy, a removal of this epiretinal membrane. And a year later on, uh, only about last week, I, when I saw her, she maintained good architecture of the um, macula. In fact, the foveal pit has come back on and she maintains visual acuity of about 6'9". Her pre presenting visual acuity is about 6'24". So in this third case, okay, it's a 48-year-old lady who has got a rather stressful life presenting with blurring of vision and central gray shadow. Uh, this is when I first saw her in September this year. You can see that there's some elevation of the retina here and, uh, and basically some disturbance of the RPE layers. You can see pretty much like a very small dome shade and this bit here, this is what we call a small micro pigment epithelial detachment. And then lo and behold, I saw her in November, this got even worse. You can see the elevation has encroached in fact, has already lifted up uh, most part of her fovea. So, does anyone know what this condition is? Okay, a further clue. This patient actually improved in her vision and improved in the OCT scan finding, and I've not done anything for her. Yes, that's central serous retinopathy. So, the key is that this patient has a stressful life. This patient has uh, presented with blurring of vision in, uh, centrally with a gray shadow. Now bear in mind, although she has blurring of vision, her level of vision is still not bad at about say 6.9 to 6.7.5, even here, okay? And subsequently when this recovered, she, she, made, she, she improved back to 6.7.5. Although there's still some kind of light scotoma, not so dense scotoma in her vision. So this is typical of central serous retinopathy or CSR. In the next case, I have a 65-year-old lady who had multiple intravitreal injection of eccentrics or ranibizumab for a wet macular degeneration. Uh, over, this, over the past eight months, her visual acuity is still maintained at 5 over 60 due to some retinal fibrosis, and she was referred to me for further management. Let me show you when I first saw her in July. This is the OCT scan. You see large dark spaces in her retina with the retina relatively thickened. And you can see that there's elevation of the RPE cells, some sub-RPE shadowing indicative of fibrosis. Uh, so what is the uh, further test I would do here? So I would know that this patient has not responded to anti-VEGF uh, injection. I'm suspecting that this patient might have what we call polypoidal corridor vasculopathy. And true enough, this test is called endocyanine angiography, where FFA was shown by Dr. Wong earlier. Fluorescein was, was injected into, a, uh, into the blood in order to illustrate the flow of the blood system. Now, fluorescein angiography is good for the retinal vessels because it's more superficial. Endocyanin angiography, because the light that is used has a, 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 a larger wavelength and therefore penetrates deeper into the retina in order to visualize the choroid. Bear in mind, the choroid is underneath the retina. So, this ICG itself shows that there's some lesion over the inferior temporal arcade with a bright spot or what we call a hyper-intense lesion towards the end of this series of scan. And there's some branching vascular network. So this is the culprit here that's persistently leaking into her central macula to cause persisting macular thickening and cystoid spaces. So I performed Focal, uh, fo uh, focal photodynamic therapy for this patient, targeting the uh, what we call the hyper-intense lesion, which is polypoidal corridor vasculopathy lesion, and she showed tremendous improvement in the macular thickening. However, we know that this could be a recurrent disease. You can see there's some thickening there, and I've therefore continued with her uh, intravitreal anti-VEGF uh, treatment. So this highlights the importance of using what we call multimodal imaging technique. So just like you've got, a, or you've got an iPhone here, or you've got a typical Android phone here, we basically use multiple apps to do different functions. 
So OCD scan is good for looking at the macula, but if you are suspecting such uh, vascular lesions, sometimes we may need, we need angiography to illustrate this. So this is a little bonus for you guys. This patient came to me for cataract surgery. This is a fundus photo of both her right and left eye. At first glance, I don't see any kind of a dramatic uh, abnormality, but on further inspection, I can see that there's something abnormal with this right optic nerve head. I'll give you two seconds to spot the abnormality. The left optic disc looks normal. Okay, you got it. There's some, something here, right? There's this blood vessels here, but at the same time, there's kind of like a splinter hemorrhage on her right optic nerve head. The next question you want to ask me is what's the patient's uh, intraocular pressure? I will tell you it's near normal at about 19 as well. And the left eye is also about 19 millimeter mercury. So in our Zeiss SERS uh, OCT machine, it's, it's also capable of actually doing an OCT scan of the optic nerve head. This is a summary report of the uh, nerve fiber layer thickness as well as the neuro, neuro retinal rim thickness uh, of this patient's right and left eye. So I was suspecting something abnormal in the inferior uh, quadrant of her right optic nerve head. And true enough, look at this line here. This, this dotted line is representative, re representative of the left uh, eye, whereas the, uh, the complete line here is OD, the right eye, okay? So you can see that the left eye is more or less in the green zone, maybe venturing to the amber zone in the, in the nasal quadrant, but the Right, the right eye scan, you can see it's very evident that it's been given a red zone. This red zone means it's abnormal, okay, which means the thickness of the neuroretinal rim has fallen into much thin zone, less than, uh, probably less than 150 microns, okay. So this tells me this patient most likely has normal tension glaucoma. So I've treated this patient with uh, glaucoma drops. And I'm pleased to see that the, there's resolution on the uh, on the on the resolution of the splinter hemorrhage. This patient, unfortunately, has started to develop paracentral uh, uh, scotoma on her Humphrey Bishop field and is currently under uh, monitor by myself. So this picture shows the resolution of the splinter hemorrhage. The next patient, the next patient is a 60-year-old gentleman. You can see that I purposefully have left out the history so that you can listen to me. I know it's nearing towards the end of the talk. So people might be losing attention a bit, but please try to focus. Uh, this patient here is a is a forty year old uh, gentleman with uh, macular thickening, some subretinal fluid, and you can see cystoid changes in his right macula. This patient has diabetes for the past ten years, and you can see he has got diabetic macular edema. So in the past, people would have done some focal laser treatment. However, in this day and age, anti VEGF is what uh, the first line of treatment is. So you can just see this patient was given intravitreal IA injection and over months, this patient has shown improvement in the architecture of the OCT scan. Um, his visual, presenting visual acuity is about 624 and the right eye has improved to about 612 with about four injections. So this is, this is to recap, this is a normal looking fundus retina with healthy blood vessels and patients with diabetic retinopathy can have leakage uh, in the form of exudation, microaneurysms means small dot hemorrhages and blood hemorrhages, these are larger hemorrhages. You can see this patient also has venous beating where the blood vessels looks a bit uh, distorted. And some of these blood vessels may have what we call intraretinal macrovascular abnormality where it's probably a step before developing neovascularization. So what we do is that we introduce a very fine gauge needle into the past plana of the patient, about 3.5 to 4 millimeter away from the limbus. This is a safe zone where the anti-VEGF is uh, delivered. The typical volume is 0 0.05 mil. So it's probably about two drops of uh, eye drops if you squeeze out from a typical uh, over-the-counter uh, dry eye bottle of eye drops. So the next patient also has a macular problem, but this time around it is a surgical problem. This is the clue I've given you. You can see here when he presented on this left scan, he has a gap in the middle of his macula, and there is like a little leaflet here whereby vitreous is still attached here and there's some traction. So this patient here who has got no retinal tissue at all in this, in this gap here has got full thickness 
macular hole. So with this, he needs surgical treatment in the form of internal bidding membrane, pale pass plantar vitrectomy, and a gas tamponade with face down posturing in order to promote closure of this macular hole. So this operation is performed through three uh, uh, access routes whereby uh, a light pipe was introduced, vitrector is used to remove the jelly, and an infusion pumps in fluid to replace uh, fluid or jelly that's being removed. So this is a picture of the patient just about when I've completed internal limiting membrane peel. You can see that this patient does not have natural blue eyes or blue retina. This is stain that we use to highlight where the membrane is because it's a, such a transparent, thin structure, probably only about two or three microns thick. And therefore, the stain is so important to highlight where the, the, the membrane is in order to facilitate a safe removal of this membrane. You can see now that the macular hole has closed after about six months uh, follow-up. The next patient, case eight, we are jumping from uh, pathology to pathology so that you can use your brain now, you use the, the, the knowledge that you have, you have learned from Dr. Wong's lecture in order to be applied to these uh, cases. This patient presented with distortion and reduced vision in his uh, right eye for the past one week. You can see here that the uh, foveal control is lost and also here there's kind of a swelling of the retina with underlying uh, uh, so intense signal underneath the retina. This dark si signal probably represents fluid underneath the retina. So this patient most likely has what we call wet age related macular degeneration. So he received an uh, injection of intravitreal anti vangf such as uh, ILEA or Acentrix, and he has shown quick resolution because he presented early. So again, if you have any patients presenting with distortion, please refer them early because the earlier they come for treatment, they respond very well. And if some of the slides that Dr. Wong had shown earlier, there are patients with macular hemorrhages or scarring. Unfortunately, these cases may require more injections and more time to improve if they ever will. Unfortunately, some of them may not. I want to share with you this very interesting case. If you follow the flow chart of this uh, photo, I saw this patient in early November, on, uh, early November last year, one, almost a year ago. This patient presented, you can see this dark area here uh, with what we call a deep retinal or deep corridor hemorrhage. His phobia is relatively spread, but because it's so close by to his macula or his phobia, he actually had symptoms of uh, blurriness and slight distortion over his lower quadrant. So bear in mind, anything that's at the top here will be seen by the patient at the bottom. So I given him the first injection of anti-VEGF. Uh, unfortunately, when he came to see me a month later, there is expansion of the vision. Of course, I panic and he panic. So I've explained to him that we need to continue with this treatment. It took about three to four uh, months of visit before I start to see some uh, reduction in the lesion. So you can see the, the size of the lesion actually in, increased. Uh, in the first three months of follow-up before he started to respond to the injection. At this juncture here, I've actually changed his uh, injection to another different type of anti vegf and it showed a much more uh, rapid resolution. You can see that there's flattening of the uh, uh, RPE here. So, here I'm going to show you the, the use of the uh, OCT angiography. So, because of collection of dark fluid or blood underneath the RPE, uh, it's very difficult to actually uh, see beyond the uh, retinal layer. However, the OCTA could actually uh, help us to visualize some of the uh, 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 choroidal or choroid capillaries here. At the same time, uh, this is the, the, the enlarged uh, image of this, of this scan here. Basically, we can see that there are potentially choroidal neovascular membrane or abnormal uh, blood vessels growing here. So these are the, uh, what we call the B scans of the uh, patient's uh, macula, okay? So this is the beauty of OCT and geography. At the click of a but button, less than 10 seconds, you can capture the vasculature of this patient's uh, uh, macula. Again, a uh, different um, uh, imaging technique by the OCT machine. This is what, we call, again, it's the same patient I've shown you earlier. This has a, what we call an on fast OCT. We are looking at the, uh, the swelling or the pigment epithelial detachment. You can see the blood vessels of the retina is actually crossing over the uh, pigment epithelial detachment or suspecting there might be some abnormal uh, cardio neovascular membrane because you can see here there's some what we call uh, 
like a denting of the uh, PED here. So I'm pleased to note that the patient, after months of treatment, has shown resolution uh, migrating from this picture here to that. Case number 10. This patient is, in, uh, is a again a diabetic patient with, uh, presenting with reduced vision in her left eye for at least uh, a year. You can see here that there are a few pathology here, so I'll go through with you uh, slowly. First and foremost, this is abnormal. This is the left eye. You can see that the macula is actually tented up. There's a very thick line coming across. So this is an epiretinal membrane with traction of the uh, vitro macula. Uh, uh, interface. You can see that the epiretinal membrane has caused undulation on the surface of the retina. This, this fibrotic tissue has pulled onto the uh, fovea on the macula to cause it to lose its normal shape like this to that uh, configuration. So this patient will, will require surgery at the same time uh, a combined intravitreal anti-VEGF to reduce uh, the swelling. And thankfully about uh, six months post-operatively she had some normalization of the uh, retinal uh, architecture. So this is the picture of her, of her preoperatively. You can see lots of fibrotic tissue. Again, Dr. Wong had mentioned earlier, sometimes if the uh, uh, visual acuity is good, we do not intervene. However, in this context, a presenting visual acuity is only 660. And therefore, uh, uh, after discussing the patient, we have proceeded to remove the uh, scar tissue and peel off the membrane which has caused traction on her fovea, okay? And this has seen improvement in the visual acuity to 612. Interesting, in these patients, the same patient who I presented earlier, case number 10, this is her right eye. Again, she has got a thickened macula with subretinal fluid. And again, after, uh, after five injections, she has showed very slow response. However, nevertheless, there is improvement in the architecture of her uh, macula with a reduction in thickening of the uh, uh, intraretinal fluid. Uh, as we know that diabetic diabetes is a long-term disease, it's a metabolic illness which does not leave anyone who has been infected with it, inflicted with it. So uh, we need to continue with the injection in the long term until we see uh, normalization of the architecture of the macula. Again, this is the OCTA, OCT and geography of the patient. Uh, illustrating that uh, there's leakage around the uh, macula. Uh, you can see that uh, the, the blood vessels, some of the capillaries are actually dropped out, like this area here. This area. Hi, and there's Hi this is Isaac. How can I help you? Hello. Uh, I need to uh, check my Hello. 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 So there's, there's enlargement of the phobia avascular zone. We can see here that the, the, uh, the system actually allows us to color code the areas of capillary dropouts. Uh, you can see that uh, the blue zone represents areas with poor uh, vascular supply to the cap to the macular region. And those areas which are red here shows that there's still blood supply. And uh, from artificial intelligence or deep learning, this machine can actually tell us the size of the foveal avascular zone. So these images are actually important for us to monitor patients' uh, progress, to monitor patients' uh, 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 response to treatment. So I did mention that OCTA is as good as for us to illustrate the uh, va vasculature of the macula of the posterior pole of the retina. This is the OCTA. The B represents fund the, 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 uh, the ancient fundus fluorescent angiography, which has been around for the past few decades. This uh, FFA itself still holds, uh, still holds a lot of uh, respect because you can see that it shows where the areas are leaking, whereas the OCTA does not show leakage, but it shows capillary dropouts. So there's still a lot that we can uh, gather information from uh, our, our, our good old FFA or fluorescent angiogra angiography. So we are not there yet. To, to cast this out. Uh, that is why you know, we always use this term multimodal imaging uh, approach so that we can get as much information from different uh, imaging modalities. So this patient uh, is a 62 year old high myo patient uh, who has reduced visual acuity in the past one year. You can see that the, uh, 
this the the, the 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 macula itself has got rather accentuated curvature because of the high myopia. The macula, as you know, is greatly thickened. Okay, in fact, you can hardly see the structures within this. I was trying to determine if there's any macular hole here, but because of the resolution and because it's just got a bit of a cataract, the uh, quality of the image is not that great. Nevertheless, this patient has got what we call macular skysis. There's thickening of the macula due to taut posterior hyalot. Remember, uh, in patients with high myope, the behavior of their jelly on the beaches is simply abnormal, such that you can pull on the macula, you can pull on the preretinal tissue to cause thickening there. And this is sometimes uh, uh, aggravated because the patient has got staphyloma, that is out punching of the sclera due to uh, abnormal or pathological elongation of their globe due to high myopia during uh, development. So she requires surgical intervention in the form of class vena vitrectomy, posterior hyaloid peel, uh, internal limiting membrane peel. Uh, please report this patient has got good uh, architectural improvement in her macula with corresponding improve in her vision. A presenting visual acuity is about 648 and she improved to about 612. So this is another case of a patient who had uh, multiple injections in another hospital uh, for uh, a presumed uh, uh, abnormality of the macula. So she had come for second opinion. And when I look at her OCD scan, I'm just gonna scroll through and, and let you have a look, okay? This is the lower bit of the uh, inferior uh, aspect of her retina. This is the central uh, macula in her left eye. And this is her right eye. Uh, it, uh, 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 enlargement of the video uh, of the image of the right eye so basically she has been receiving uh, multiple injections in both eyes i don't see uh, the indication of it firstly the lines of the, uh, the inner outer structures of the macula are all intact no doubt she has got a uh, epiretinal membrane but you can see the preservation of the fovea contour her visual acuity is still about six seven point five and i will not even dream about doing any surgery for this patient Again, she has got epiretinal membrane. It's very common for such patients because they have, they have thickened posterior hyaloid, which is the posterior aspect of their vitreous. And again, because this is away from their fovea, it's not causing distortion, and this can be left alone. So no operation. In her right eye, you can see that there's very fine, thin feather of jelly still attached to the fovea. I agree that there's some change in the angle of the uh, of the fovea is not as uh, gently sloping, but it's probably slightly tented up, uh, what we can call a mild form of vitreal macular traction or vitreal foveal traction. So this is an enlargement of the image. However, again, her visual acuity is about 6, 7.5 to 6, 9, and there's not much symptoms of uh, distortion. I've elected to observe this, and the patient is happy with the arrangement. Unlike this case, this is a patient who has got <clears throat> poorly controlled diabetes, uh, presented to me with much reduced vision in his left eye. You can see it's very evident this patient has got subretinal fluid, has got a lot of epiretinal membrane, but not much of a macular thickening. So what's going on here? So this patient has got tractional retinal detachment. That is the retina is actually peeled off the uh, uh, choroid or the retinal pigment epithelial layer due to traction as well as retinatogenous component because of prolonged traction he had developed a tear in the retina which had allowed fluid within the vitreal cavity to sit underneath the retina to cause further elevation so this patient has no choice but to have a vitrectomy but due to the complexity of the uh, retinal detachment it required a further long longer term of a uh, tamponade so i put in silicon oil you can see that some reflection in his uh, black and white fundus photo nevertheless uh, due to his diabetes as well as the uh, uh, severity of his retinal detachment, he had developed an uh, epiretinal membrane with persisting intraretinal fluid or macular edema. So after tamponade for about a few months to maintain uh, attach reattachment of the uh, retina, he underwent removal of silicon oil and, uh, and cataract surgery. And please report now, you can see a much more, much healthier looking uh, fovea contour with a subsequent improvement in his visual acuity. His presenting visual acuity is only about counting fingers here and improved to about 612 here. Again, another patient who had come to my clinic, 
This is an OCT, OCT scan of uh, this patient's uh, of this patient's macula. You can see that the retina is actually elevated. There's no connection between the macula and the RPE. This patient basically has detachment of the macula, and she underwent retinal reattachment surgery plus plana, plus plana vitrectomy with silicon oil uh, due to proliferative vitro retina uh, retinopathy, and you can see a uh, normalization of the foveal contour. This patient is interesting. This patient has got a giant retinal tear causing uh, uh, macular detachment. You can see that this patient again has got undulating uh, appearance of her macula with no connection to the RPE layer. So uh, the, uh, three, uh, to a week after the uh, surg primary surgery of reattaching uh, the retina, obviously this patient will need uh, silicon oil due to uh, the giant retinal tear, uh, or giant retinal detachment. Uh, unfortunately, she has some retention of a heavy liquid. Heavy liquid is a, a, a kind of a chemical liquid that a retinal surgeon use to actually flatten the retina during surgery in order to facilitate a, a laser treatment as well as a reattachment of the retina. However, due to the large size of the retinal tear, some of this heavy liquid can get underneath the retina and there's a preponderance for the heavy liquid to get underneath the uh, uh, macular region. Uh, we did mention about elevation of retina and all that. You can see that this elevation is quite interesting. If you can use your imagination a bit, I'm trying to draw the shape of this elevation, okay? You can see that the elevation is more akin to that of an omega shape. So if you look at this elevation here, compared to previous elevation like central sidrous retinopathy, this has got a much more acute angle, okay? This is more typical of a retention of heavy liquid. Uh, thankfully, after about uh, a few months, I've removed the heavy liquid through a very small microscopic needle aspiration and you can see here there's normalization of her macular region. Fortunately, there's no damage to her vision and she had uh, shown uh, appropriate uh, improvement in her visual acuity. So, OCT technology has been around for almost more than a decade now. In fact, uh, its use has been expanded. You can see this is a, a, a video capture of a patient's uh, OCT scan. Uh, do you know when this was captured? Well, basically when I'm doing operation to remove vitreous hemorrhage from this patient who has got a vein occlusion, you can see that there's residual retinal hemorrhage. There you can see that some uh, small blood hemorrhages in the retina and these blood vessels is pretty much uh, cork screwed. So this, is, this scan was taken when I'm doing the operation for this patient because I want to determine if this patient has got macular thickening in order for me uh, to make a decision to give her intra vitro anti vagf treatment. So the OCT scan is actually incorporated into the microscope, which allows me to capture uh, the macula. You can see on the right hand side, there's thickening of the macula, which justifies uh, my clinical judgment or decision to give her an anti vagf uh, uh, injection. So you can see the, 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 the presence of OCT is everywhere now, not just in the clinic, you can even do it in the theatre. In fact, there's also OCT scan, there's handheld that can be used in the paediatric or children age group. So another case, uh, I'm just uh, showing this patient who has got a corneal disease with bullet or, or, or blister on the surface of the cornea due to endothelial disease. So I perform what we call a uh, DSEC, uh, decimate stripping endothelial keratoplasty, where we just transplant the uh, posterior layer of the uh, stroma. And you can see OCT scan can also be used to visualize uh, the decimase membrane here. So a transplanted uh, decim uh, uh, posterior stroma uh, or decimase membrane here show, uh, basically shows that there's good attachment between the transplanted layer and that of the patient's host. You can see this, this line here basically that's where I actually strip off the decimase membrane. So OCT scan has also a function of doing imaging of the anterior segment. Of course, we can do this in another talk. So this patient has shown visual improvement. So I'll leave you with this image here. Uh, basically, tell me, what do you see? So this is a, a, a rather wide field uh, imaging of the OCT. You can see some intraretinal cystic changes. You can see a shadow here, probably exudation or a hemorrhage. You can see the choroid here, not so thick, probably a bit thicker over here, a bit thinner here. You can see the posterior hyaloid, posterior hyaloid or the posterior surface of the vitreous. So this patient has probably impending K 
PVD, you can see the which is still attached probably to the optic nerve head here. So this patient has got underlying diabetes. So if you, hopefully the more OCD images that you've seen, I know you've seen hundreds today, that's probably what I would expect you to be able to do some interpretation, even though you have not seen the patient. But again, it's important that you link the patient's OCT image with that of the history and clinical finding, i.e. the fundus image. With that, I thank you for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Ho. Do you all have any question to either myself or Dr. Ho? You can, uh, if you, uh, you can also type your question on the chat box. I think that uh, the whole idea of this uh, quick cram course is to give you an overview of a common OCT retinal images that uh, you would probably see if you have invested an OCT machine in your primary care practice. And although this is not uh, supposed to be a, to replace you to be a retinal uh, uh, specialist, but with such uh, education, we hope that you are able to, at the primary care level, have an idea what is happening to the patient's uh, retinal layer so that you can actually uh, be comforted to know if this patient has a normal retina and the blurry, blurriness of vision is probably not related to retinal disease or if you are trying to reflect somebody and you cannot improve reflection and then you do OCT then you see there's some kind of uh, say macular pucker right you know that it's very futile to just keep on reflecting them and you probably need to uh, tell your patient to probably see a, a, a secondary or tertiary care instead. So I think this is a uh, very condensed lecture. Uh, now, I'm, as a good news, I'm going to uh, ask my staff to post this in Isaac YouTube, probably in a couple of days or two. So you can look back again, because we have so many images, all right, uh, that we have sent you. You can look at a leisure, so you can be wise. And if you can recognize about 80 to 90% of what I and Dr. Ho has presented, you'll probably be as good, all right, uh, as most generalist uh, ophthalmologists uh, general uh, practice uh, because uh, uh, you will be able to capture most of the uh, common retinal pathology. I know you are tired and if uh, I don't see any more questions then I would like to close this uh, symposium and I'd like to wish everybody a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year and we would like to do uh, meaningful webinar uh, from time to time and if you have any specific requests you can either talk to our staff in Isaac notably Kelly or Vivian who coordinate all the educational uh, programs for both the public for the optometrists and the medical students thank you very much for joining us bye-bye thank you bye-bye